Hello, everyone. I am Brandon Mahan. I'm a researcher at James Cook University uh, in Queensland here in Australia. And as the title suggests, today I'll just be talking with you all about some high throughput element purification, of course, using Triscan resins, and um, namely about how this can be applied to sort of more commercialized or, or upscaled areas uh, where we use isotope analyses, so such as in medical applications or exploration and beyond. So just to start, I thought I would just preface things with who I am exactly and a little bit about what, what I work on and why that's relevant here. So I'm a visiting researcher at, at a number of different places. I'm here in Australia, but also internationally and namely in, in France. Um, and beyond just trying to develop uh, collaborative networks for stable metal isotope analyses and things like that. Uh, in terms of applications, I do a fair bit of uh, sort of cosmochemistry and then also looking at medical applications for stable metal isotopes. And then also on the more technical side, uh, just doing methods development and within that basically trying to make normal ion exchange chromatography protocols go faster because as we'll talk about here shortly, uh, I consider that the sort of Achilles heel of, of this whole business. So I've sort of put this in a story arc, I guess, a bit like a movie. So hopefully it'll be relatively easy to, to follow along and uh, will be entertaining at least at points. So the very first thing to cover here is what exactly is isotope geochemistry, or at least the areas within that that I'm working in. And, and what's the workhorse of that? So this really boils down to most of the time anyways, the use of a multi-collector inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer or MCI-CPMS. So basically how one of these instruments work for anyone who's not familiar is that we ionize isotopes and basically we're stripping away electrons using an argon plasma burning basically around the same temperature or a bit hotter actually than the surface of the sun. And that's then going to make single positively charged cations that can then be accelerated down a flight path. So that's just what this is showing here. And basically, since those are cations, so since they are charged ions with specific uh, masses, when they interact with this giant electromagnet here, they are going to be deflected because of that electromagnetic field, um, depending on their mass, actually. So given the same charge, at least, uh, that magnet is going to then separate those ions solely based on their mass, which is basically just inertia. So the atoms or ions that have a lower mass are going to be deflected more. Those with a heavier mass are going to be deflected less, so they end up farther out. And basically then all of those collide with an array of electrically conductive detectors. So that's why it's called a multi-collector, because we have uh, multiple little detectors down the bottom of this. And basically the voltage that that creates, again, it's creating a voltage because those are charged ions. Um, so that voltage is proportional then to the number of ions. And then since we're collecting them all at the same time, uh, instantaneously or at the same time, simultaneously rather, uh, we can then determine the relative abundance of the different isotopes of a given element, zinc here, for example. Okay, so we've got one of those here at JCU. This is just a bit of a shameless plug. So we've got a Neptune multi-collector ICPMS, and we've also got a clean lab where we do all of our sample prep, et cetera. This is probably pretty familiar for some of you. And so what I wanted to point out here was what's you know sort of the big deal with running samples through a multi-collector. And really this boils down to a lot of the time anyway, spectral interferences. So um, I've just got some graphs on here. It's a bit busy. Really all I wanted to point out was, so say if you have um, the isotope of zinc, which is 64. Turns out there is also an isotope of nickel, which is 64. So if you have nickel in your solution, so most of what I'll be talking about is solution-based ICPMS, where we're turning um, a, a wet solution into a, a plasma, um, or into our ion beam, sorry. So if we've got nickel in our solution as well, basically that's going to interfere and give us a spurious amount of 64 zinc. So basically what we need to do then before we ever put things into our instrument is try to strip away everything except the element that we care about. So in this case, zinc. And what you can see is that when you have um, basically appreciable amounts of any elements that have 
these interferences with the element of interest or the isotopes of interest, it really throws off your zinc isotope compositions uh, or your measurements. So that's what's here on the y-axis is del 66 zinc. So that's just the ratio of 66 to 64 zinc in the sample versus the standard. And then we see that for titanium, barium, um, and copper and some other elements that, that these all have varying effects and some of them more than others. So definitely here you can see things like nickel and titanium. And here's just a whole smattering of a bunch of other interferences. This is all just to drive the point home that we want to use ion exchange chromatography usually uh, to basically isolate only the element that we care about. Most of the time, uh, because that's just the way that it's always been done, this is manual ion exchange chromatography. So drip chromatography, gravity chromatography, or gravity column chemistry, whatever moniker it's going by, it's all the same deal. So we've got our column, we've got a frit at the bottom, which is allowing solutions to go through, but not our resin. And then we pour in different, um, different elutants, different solutions. So, um, you know, it could be water, could be different types of acid, et cetera, et cetera. And we basically want to strip out all of the, what we usually call matrix elements. So everything that we don't want and isolate the element that we do want. So this is sort of going in step with the graph that's down here, which is an elution profile. Again, most of us are probably pretty familiar with that. So this is just the total volume of solution that we're putting through against the percent total of the elements that are coming out um, in the cuts that we're sort of analyzing here. So again, ideally we're, chopping out all of our matrix elements relatively early on, and then we're getting a nice strong peak of the element of interest, and we're not getting any sort of lag, and we're not missing any, because normally we need 100% yield or something close to it. Otherwise, we run the risk of fractionating the isotopes on the column, as it's called. Okay, so now we'll move on to where the conflict is in all of this, and, and sort of where, what the, um, heroism is, I guess, of isotope geochemistry, which is basically just the sort of high impact applications. So what I referred to at the very beginning uh, is what I consider the Achilles heel of conventional isotope geochemistry, which is the fact that most of us are relying on manual ion exchange chromatography. And so I always like to use this example for this. So say we have a pretty ambitious isotope geochemistry project that's going to entail something like 100 unique measurements and usually it's less than that so a publication could be anywhere from 20 to 100 and usually not more than that now when we're looking at meaningful sample cohorts in things like ore exploration um, soil chemistry medical analyses etc cetera, etc cetera, uh, things really balloon out so then we need something like a thousand samples to be meaningful or potentially we need something like 10,000 and so really this comes down to a scalability and translatability problem. And if you wanted to distill that down into a catchphrase, it would be workflow optimization. So just before we move on, the, the point here and why this takes so long is say you had 10 to 12 samples that you're doing through manual ion exchange chromatography, just in your fume hood or whatever, say for something like copper or zinc, end to end, that may take you anywhere from about a week to 10 days or something like that. So you can imagine even to get to 100 samples, that's going to take you a fair bit of time. And of course there's some leeway in there, but the point is it takes a long time and you would be hard pressed to ever reach 10,000 samples for a single study unless you spent you know, more, more or less an academic lifetime doing it. So that's really problematic. Okay, so why do we care then? So one of the biggest applications here, so because of time, you can see I'm starting out at application two. I had to hack one out, which is we can understand things like um, whether or not it was an impact or volcanics that um, killed the dinosaurs, a really cool thing in itself, just not enough time to cover it. You can look at that actually with zinc isotopes, but let's look at copper here. So if we wanna move to a greener fuels or greener forms of energy, alternative energy, again, you know, whatever catchphrase uh, works for you there, uh, what we can see, so this is just a, an infographic showing all the different elements or some of them or the main ones that, that are needed to go into things like the hardware, electric motors, energy storage and distribution, so grid stuff, uh, moving towards greener energies. So there's all sorts of stuff in here, but one element that's in every single aspect of this is copper. And this down here, 
Uh, this graph is just showing years projected into the future and the demand for copper. Basically, the only point I'm making here is that it's only going to get bigger and bigger, and we're running out of really you know, efficient ways to find more of this stuff. Uh, so it turns out you can use copper isotopes potentially to develop uh, more efficacious ore vectoring tools, so a means to find copper ore deposits better or you know, more efficiently. Uh, both in terms of time and cost. And the way that that works is basically when you weather copper sulfides, you will tend to put copper two plus into the solution. And what goes along with that usually is an increase in the amount of copper 65, which means you're going to end up isotopically heavy. So that's all this graph is showing here. And it sort of depends on what sulfide mineral you're actually weathering with groundwater usually, but it could be any water. Um, but the gist is that you're going to end up with water that has a heavy copper isotope composition. That's what this graph is showing here. So the black is the stuff that's proximal to a, to a deposit. So this is freshwater actually and groundwaters uh, or natural waters, things like rivers and streams, uh, but also groundwater. So when you're near a deposit and you're sampling that and you're weathering that sulfide, you end up with a heavy copper isotope composition. And then when you move away from that, you drop back down to basically background levels. And so this has been shown, so for this pebble deposit in Alaska and in some other ones as well. So a more interesting, I think, and, and something that probably feels like it has a bit more day-to-day -day, uh, impact is the use of isotopes, and, and specifically here anyway, stable metal isotopes, um, to look into biological systems and especially how we might be able to use them to create early alarm or early diagnostics for disease. So I'm just prefacing a bit of this with, you know, basically what the field of isotope metalomics is. So that all sort of starts with what the metalome is, which is the chemically active and or organically bound uh, metal or metalloid species that are present in a biological system. So then metalomics is basically just the study of anything to do with the metalome. So then it follows that the isotope metalome or isotope metalomics is the application of stable metal isotopes to biological systems. So just a step beyond metalomics. So we're not just looking at the metals, we're looking at their isotopes. And why would we wanna do this instead of just look at concentration? Uh, that is basically because uh, absolute concentrations of elements are sort of beholden to um, external or exogenous variables. So that could be anything from dietary intake to intestinal absorption, um, et cetera, et cetera. And the list sort of goes on there. Um, and it could just be, you know, genetics, population genetics. The other bit here is that uh, when we're looking at element concentrations, we're usually using an ICPMS instrument, so something like a quadrupole ICPMS, that's gonna give us precision of around three to 5%. With the multi-collector, we're 100 to 1,000 times more precise than that. Not necessarily more accurate, but at least more precise. And the whole reason this is actually applicable here is the same reason it is in geological systems. So isotope distribution governed by physics. So the strength of a chemical bond, basically, at least if we're looking at equilibrium isotope fractionation. And that's sort of decreasing in order from oxygen to nitrogen to sulfur. Basically what that means is if you have say zinc that's bound to oxygen in a biological system, that's going to be relatively speaking, isotopically heavy um, with respect to zinc bound to say nitrogen or sulfur. And the isotopes are going to fractionate in general again, independent of concentrations. So the whole point of this is, is that we have diagnostics already. So for things like say Alzheimer's disease, so that's what AD here is, um, our current tests, even though we are developing blood tests, tend to be things like um, a, a PET scan of the brain, which is looking for these plaques. Once those are actually there and you can measure them with one of these scans, that means that the disease has already really taken grip and has significantly progressed. The idea is that if we can detect uh, isotope excursions, especially in someone's blood, um, we should be able to see that earlier because that isotope fractionation is happening as quickly as the re reaction is, and potentially we will be able to see that before you have sort of um, really blown out development of these um, Alzheimer's disease plaques, which are these sort of protein tangles in someone's brain. 
And there are sort of other analogies with other diseases here. So the idea is that if we can sort of combine these, especially that maybe we'll meet in the middle somewhere, we'll have higher confidence in our test results, and we will actually catch things earlier. So this is sort of time from a terminal stage going backwards, you know, in terms of diagnostics. So we want to catch things earlier so we can, if not stop them, at least mitigate them. And there's a similar idea here with calcium isotopes. So it turns out that the calcium isotope composition of your bone is significantly lighter than a large part of large portions of the rest of your body. Uh, and in much the same way, you can detect that in, in the blood because when you have osteoporosis or experience bone loss in any other way, it's going to flush out that isotopically like calcium from your bones into your bloodstream. And you can actually pick this up. So this is calcium isotope composition here. And this is, you know, different mediums, but I'm just going to focus in here on blood serum. So if you have osteoporosis, um, then your blood serum is isotopically light for calcium relative to uh, healthy individuals, or at least healthy in terms of bone loss. And this actually will pick things up earlier than an x-ray scan. And so this is really, really promising work. And I've already covered this. I won't really go much further. Um, just for time, just to point out that we do actually have um, some incredibly important results that have come out very recently that point to the fact that we really ought to be able to catch things like copper and zinc isotope excursions in someone's blood when they have Alzheimer's disease, because we do see these excursions in their brain and by mass balance, then we should see this in their blood. Okay, so what's the deal with, how does this tie in with, with Triskim and with resin? So I've already covered manual ion exchange chromatography. We all pretty much know that there are other ways that you can go about this. You can use a vacuum, um, or a pump, so pressure to push things through a chromatographic column quicker, and then you could possibly also automate this entire system. Here I'm just going to focus on vacuum assisted ion exchange chromatography, and then I've sort of highlighted automated systems here, but probably won't really get much into that. So something that I've already done uh, is to, instead of using a pump, to just actually put the entire ion exchange chromatography process, or the columns basically, inside of a centrifuge tube, inside of a centrifuge. Turns out when you do these, do it this way and you just modulate the centrifugal force so that you end up about five to 10 times faster, so you've got a flow rate about one mil a minute, that you can do everything just a whole lot faster and get the same results. So you're not actually losing any analytical resolution, but you can speed up zinc purification around five to 10 times relative to conventional techniques. Uh, I've been developing this with the copper specific resin from Triskim, and this can be used for geological and biological samples and does the same thing. So again, five to 10 times faster. Now, what I would like to do is set this up with a vacuum box. And this is where um, sort of the cutting edge or the work that we're doing right now comes in. So we know that this can be done in a centrifuge. We also know that this can be done in a prep pass system because it has been done and that's actually published work. Uh, and we know that this is going to produce accurate copper isotope analytics. So what's the novelty here? The protocol that I'm suggesting putting together for the vacuum box um, is going to be able to do two things at once. So one of the novelties of the vacuum box that's much easier than say doing in the centrifuge and potentially even with automated systems is you can stack columns together. So that's just all this is showing. The protocol that I've put together does a very good job of removing most matrix elements um, except for little bits of say titanium and iron, which means then you can put things through tree resin also from Triskin if you like and that will get rid of um, those tricky little bits there at the end. The fortunate thing is that you can elute your copper and your titanium and bits of iron in four to eight molar nitric or hydrochloric acid and then send it straight through the true resin in the same acid and it, all it's going to do is let the copper pass through and strip off your iron and titanium and some other bits as well actually. And so this is actually a super convenient technique and super fast. Now, it turns out that you can also do the same thing with nitric acid as I hinted at before. So these are just different elution profiles. So loading in the same pH anyways, but just with a different acid, but then testing out different molarities and different acids to actually extract the copper off of the resin. Now, what I wanna focus on is the fact that you can do this with 0.5 molar nitric acid. So you can strip off 
the copper very effectively, just as effectively as with anything else, basically, with 0.5 molar nitric acid. The reason I keep saying that is because that is basically the same molarity of acid that we introduce things to the multi-collector ICPMS with, which means potentially, and this is something that we're going to test, is you could take this off the column and instead of drying it down and taking it back up, you may be able to just basically send this straight to the instrument and cut out 24 to 48 hours of lab time, which is, again, incredibly significant. Now, because of the osteoporosis stuff, I also want to look into doing this with calcium. So with DGA resin, of course, again, from Triskem, uh, it turns out you can very, very effectively uh, remove matrix elements and elute calcium. So this is just some different elution profiles from uh, published works. This is Lamping and all 2018. And this is your calcium spike. This is all your matrix elements. And then this is actually the uh, Pormond and Dofal work earlier on that basically uh, was the precursor to this. And basically the idea here is that we know this will work in higher throughput uh, techniques. And this is pretty much on off chemistry. So you sort of load and rinse everything in formal and nitric acid and you rinse in H2O. And there you go, you've got your calcium. So this is easily adaptable to high flow rate ion exchange chromatography. So potentially we could do this in a centrifuge, we could do this in a vacuum box, and something that we are actively actually pursuing now in a collaborative effort um, is to do this in basically a, a dipstick form. So if you've got something in four molar nitric acid, you've got your calcium in there, say it's a urine sample or a blood sample that's been acidified, you dip your dipstick into it that's got DGA resin on it, pulls all the calcium off, and then you stick that into uh, basically just ultra pure water and it allows all the calcium to drop off and then you know whether or not you have to uh, treat that further before it goes to the instrument or not not really sure but the idea is is that we could turn this into a very simple um, kit basically a test kit that could then be applied to things like osteoporosis and this is just showing sort of the spread and calcium isotope compositions in a, in a mammal uh, or in mammals. So this is mini pigs, uh, various fauna and human beings. And just to show that there's actually a large spread there. So anything above about one per mil is large, more or less, in anything except the really light isotope systems. And this is really promising then for picking up changes in the body. So